I'm going to be a little bit more specific about what an incidence half algebra is. So I start with a hereditary family of intervals, and that means that it's a family of, of uh, posets with a bottom and a top element, which is closed undertaking subintervals and closed undertaking products. And then I have a, a reduced congruence on P, and so I'm going to tell you what that is now. So it's an equivalence relation that, ha that satisfies the following properties. So if you have one of, one of the elements of your family and it has one element, then P times Q is going to be um, equivalent to P, and it's going to be equivalent to Q times P. Okay? Um, so that's one property. Another property is that if P and Q are equivalent, then P times R is equivalent to Q times R, and R times P is equivalent to R times Q. Okay? And finally, um, if P and Q are equivalent, then we're going to require that there is a bijection, so there exists a bijection F from P to Q such that um, 0x in P is equivalent to 0f of x in Q and x1 in P is equivalent to f of x1 in Q. Okay? So I think the, the first two are fairly straightforward. For the third one, let me, let me point out that there's some subscripts that uh, I am omitting for, yeah? So, to, to be a reduced congruence, you need to satisfy these three properties. And I mean, I agree that this is the least trivial one. I mean, this is this is the one that has the most content, but these two are also important. Um, let's let's think about what what this is about. For for example, this means that if if you want to define, I mean, remember that we our half algebra is a, is the members are equivalence classes. So. If P and Q are equivalent, that means that in the Hoff algebra, they're going to be the same thing. Right? P is going to be equal to Q. And if I want to multiply my Hoff algebra, then if P is equal to Q, then P times R should be equal to Q times R. And so that, here I'm just saying that multiplication is well defined. Uh, analogously here, uh, I'm saying that the coproduct is well defined. Because if P and Q are equivalent, then P is equal to Q in the Hoff algebra, which means that when I take the coproduct, the, the coproduct delta of P is going to be the sum of this times for this over all x in P. And if I take the coproduct of Q, then I'm going to get the sum of this times for this. And so, and so this property tells me that, um, that the coproduct is well defined on equivalence class. Okay? Um, this, is a, this is about the, the unit and the co-unit. And uh, one thing to mention here is that we, we had this uh, issue come up last time that I was not prepared to address, and I, I realized why I was not prepared to address it. Um, last time I told you how u of 1 was, uh, was the point, was the, the, the one-point interval that only has one element. And the question was, wh why is that well-defined? And uh, I couldn't remember at the moment why. And the reason is that I, I had it written down for you with reduced congruences. But if you think about it, if you have p and q, so let me let me. So if P is a point, then Q is also a point, and maybe they have different names. So this is little P and this is little Q. Uh, well, according to the the first property of being a reduced congruence, you have that P times Q should be equivalent to Q to P because Q has one element, but it should also be equivalent to Q because P has one element. And therefore, P and Q are going to be the same element in the half algebra. Okay? And um, so my, my point is that reduced congruences identify all, all posits of one element together. 
and u of 1 is going to be that thing. Okay? Um, so this is these are basically the conditions that you need so that uh, when, you, when you take the product, co-product, etc., uh, and you mod out by the equivalence relation, then everything is still well-defined. Okay? So, so this is what an incidence Hopf algebra is. Okay? And uh, so... Now we're going to continue to do some examples. Okay. Now, I'm going to I'm going to start by by giving a remark here. What if P is closed under taking subintervals? Let me, instead of phrasing it as a question, let me, let me phrase it as a statement. So if P is closed under taking subintervals, but it is not closed under taking products, okay? And in fact, it's very much not closed under taking products in the sense that If P and Q are in your family, then P times Q is not in your family. Okay? So this is a family that is not hereditary, right? Very much not so because it's very much not close undertaking products. Um, but then what I want to claim is that from such a thing, I can make a hereditary family. By defining what, I call, what I'm going to call P star. And, I mean, it's, it's the usual trick in mathematics where if something is not closed, then you force it to be closed. So, if I'm not closed under taking products, then what happens? Well, it means that you know, I have P and Q in P, but I don't have this guy, but I, and I would like to have this guy. And so what I do is that I just throw it in. Okay? I throw it in, but then I have to change the name of my, of my family. And so I, I got a P star. And what I do is that I, I just throw in all the possible products. Okay? So this is kind of a closure under taking products. Okay. So let me define this family and now let me make two claims. First claim, this is closed undertaking products, right? It's pretty obvious because a product of two products is a product. Uh, so it is closed undertaking products. Let me also claim that it is closed under taking subintervals. Can you see why that is? So if I take a subinterval of, of let me let me a subinterval of P one up to PK is what? Well it's something comma something. Right? Where these things are elements in here, so one element is going to be P1 up to PK, and the second element is going to be Q1 up to QK. Right? And this is less than or equal to this in the product posit. But remember that in a product posit, this is, equal, this is less than or equal to this if and only if each coordinate here is less than or equal to each coordinate here. So you need that um, P1 is less than or equal to Q1, up to PK is less than or equal to QK, okay? And then what, uh, what you can show, it's very easy to show, is that this thing is going to be isomorphic to P1 
P1, Q1 times P, K, Q, K. So there's a posted a post isomorphism between this and this. And uh, if you don't see right away why, why this is true, then I think this is a, a, a useful exercise for you to do to familiarize yourself with uh, posets and products and things like this. Um, but then the point is that, you know, P1 is less than or equal to Q1, and they belong to the, to the first poset. So this is an interval of P1, capital P1. And this is an interval of pk. Okay. Now, given that p1 up to pk are in my family p, and given that the family p is closed under subintervals, that means that all of these guys are in my family p. And when I take their product, I'm going to be in p star. Okay. So this is closed under taking subintervals also. In other words, this is a hereditary family. Uh, and that's, that's the next thing I was going to say, which is that uh, if you have a reduced congruence on this one, then uh, you're going to inherit a reduced congruence here in kind of the trivial way. And we'll see that in an example. Okay. And so the, the point is basically that if, you, if you're in this setup and you would like to apply the incidence half algebra machinery, then you can do it by, taking, by just taking the parts of these things. Okay. And that's going to be my next source of examples. So let me give you... Yeah? Uh, so, so the question is whether this condition is essential, um, and uh, it's a good question. I'm, I'm wondering if you need some kind of unique factorization to make this to make this uh, work, but that that might not be the case actually. Um, So far, I haven't needed this. I agree. So, if you don't mind, let's let's take this to the forum and, and uh, whether this third condition is necessary. And I mean, I guess naturally this one too. Um, okay. So, let's do an example. So let's think of a simple family of poses that is closed under subintervals, but not under products. And I think that the, the simplest one I can think of is the family of finite linear orders. Okay. Um, or if you prefer it, finite chains. A linear order is the same thing as chain. In other words, there are the poses that look like this. Okay? And um, so if this has n edges, we're going to call it. Sorry, I need to remember that green doesn't show up on the video. So if I have n edges, then I'm going to call this poset L sub n. Okay. Okay. So it's clear that this is closed under taking subintervals, right? Because every subinterval of a chain is a chain. Sure, let's take, 
I mean, uh, one, one thing that I mentioned is that very often uh, the reduced congruence is going to be isomorphism. It's clear that isomorphism respects all of those properties. And here, I want it to be. Isomorphism. Um, OK. And now, what I'm going to do, right, so then the equivalence classes look like this. And so now, Um, this is not hereditary undertaking products, and so we're going to take all products of, of these things. Okay. And uh, this is what I did last time. So take all products of... Um, And let me and let me define this to be also isomorphism. Okay. And so this is this is precisely what I called the, the boxes last time, right? So all, all the possible parts of linear orders. Um, and so then okay, so what do we get? We get well, for maybe before. Before describing the the product and co-product structure, let's describe the the linear algebra structure. So, what's the linear basis for this thing? Well, this. These things. Now, should I just rewrite this? I mean, let, let me rephrase. Is that a linear basis? I mean, it's a linear generating set because I define this to be the, I define my half algebra to be the span of these things. So, but I'm asking if it's a basis now. So, Zaf, you're telling me that it isn't, so why not? And I agree with you. The, right, because the thing is that the thing is that some of these things are going to be equal to each other. Like L A times L B is going to be equal to L B times L A, right? And so here I have a bunch of repetitions, and so I should decide, you know, given a box like L three times L five times L two times L one times L zero, let me just write it in a standard way. And so I'll write it by by putting it in in decreasing order, for example. So let's say I write it L five times L three times L two times L one times L zero. Okay, so I'm going to get this, and now I'm going to have no redundancy under under permuting coordinates. Uh, yeah. So I thought you last time you said Right. So that's that's the other issue that uh, if uh, if we have factors of L zero, L zero is just a point, and when you multiply by a point, you don't change isomorphism class, and so you do, you shouldn't have if this is a linear basis, then you shouldn't have factors equal to zero. So. Um, so this is how it is, and you can you can easily check that these really are all different from each other. Okay, these poses really are different from each other, uh, and so that's going to be a linear basis. Okay, and uh, let me just say that something like this is exactly what's called a partition.
So a partition is a decreasing sequence of positive integers. Okay? And it's kind of a strange name to call it a partition because it sounds like you're partitioning something. And well, it's 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 called a partition of the sum. Okay? So for example, 7, 5, 3 is a partition of 15. Or 3, 2, 1, 1 is a partition of 7. Okay. So a linear basis for this space is given by all partitions, um, except that I'm missing the trivial, like the trivial one where it's kind of the empty partition, right? Okay. That's a linear basis. Uh, what is the... Well, maybe I'm going to use this space over here, so before I use it, uh, well, no, I'll come back to this, because I want to say something about this. So, so that's my linear basis. Now, what is a, uh, a generating set as an algebra? And here, we go to a question that several of you have asked me at different points. What is the difference between a basis and a generating set? Okay? And it just depends how you're generating. So linear basis means that everything in your Hopf algebra is a linear combination of these things. Whereas a generating set as an algebra means that you're also allowed to multiply things in the generating set. Okay? And so the generating set here is going to be just you know, this. Right? Because using these guys, by multiplication, you can obtain all of these guys. Okay? So that's the generating set as an algebra. Um, what is the product Well, given, given that this is a generating set, you can just define how to multiply these guys. And if you know how to multiply some of these guys, then you're going to be able to multiply anything in your algebra because anything in the algebra can be represented in terms of these guys. Okay. So how do you multiply L A times L B? You just it's just L A times L B. Right? So this is what's called a, a free product in that, you know, there's really no relation between L A L B and, and any of the other generators. Except there's one relation, right? which is that LA times LB is equal to LB times LA, because those two things are isomorphic. And so this is what's called the free commutative product. The product commutes, but other than commuting, there's no relations. So free commutative product. Uh, the on only relations are LA, LB equals LB, LA. And there's another kind of trivial relation, right? Which is when you multiply by L0, because we said that L0 is, is the one of our, of our algebra. Right? L0 is a point. When you multiply a point times anything, you get that anything back. So free commutative product. So if you want to multiply L3 times L7 times L5, you just get L3 times L7 times L5. Except if you want, you can order decreasingly L7, L5, L3. That's the product, coproduct. Well, what is the coproduct of uh, Ln, let's say? So I'll end us like this. Go ahead, Sam. Right. So, 
So if, if we want to know what delta of ln is, then remember what we do is we, we apply delta. We just see all, all the ways of, of you know, taking an element of the poset and then splitting from here to here and then from here to here. And so we call this, if, if there's i elements here, then there's going to be n minus i. Sorry, if, there, if, there's, if this is li, this is ln minus i. Remember, this is not a thing of elements, right? It, it's more that if, if there's n links here, then there's i links here and n minus i links here. And so what we get is sum over from i equals 0 to n of li tensor l n minus i. Okay? That's the coproduct. Um, given Given that coproduct, um, I mean, given that I know the coproduct on the generators, that means that I know the coproduct on anything, right? Because remember that uh, delta is an algebra map, so delta of LM, LN is just delta of LM times delta of LN. So it's enough to define the coproduct on the generators. Okay? Uh, antipode. You may have already seen that this is in your homework. Right, so this is, you're going to compute it in homework four. Um, unit, um, u of one is the one element poset, which is here called L0. And the core unit. Uh, epsilon of, again, it's enough to define it on the basis elements because epsilon is also an algebra map. Sorry, it's, it's enough to define it on the generating set. Okay, And again, this is just equal to uh, 1 if n is equal to 0 and 0 otherwise. Okay, And so, and so here we get... Uh, a new Hopf algebra that we hadn't seen before. These are the, the generators. These are the relations as a, uh, for multiplication. This is the coproduct. You'll figure out what the antipode is. This is the unit and the co-unit. Okay. Um, and the theorem that we will prove later on is that the Hopf algebra of this half algebra that we just constructed is isomorphic to a very important half algebra called sim. Okay? And so this theorem means nothing to you because you don't know what sim is. But, uh, but I want to say it because it's an important theorem, and we'll, and we'll see that sim is an extremely important half algebra. So this is the half algebra of symmetric functions. And uh, well, maybe by the name you can already tell that that this that there's going to be something interesting here because so far there's nothing symmetric here. We're not we're the, the way that I define this is I'm not talking about symmetric functions. And so what I'm anticipating is that there's going to be a connection between this and symmetric functions. And we'll see we'll see precisely what that is later on. Okay, but uh, but this is one of the most important examples of of uh, Hopf algebra. Um, let me, before I continue, make a plug for the, for the two Algebra, Geometry, Combinatorics seminars. We have one today at 3.30, which is an unusual day and time, today, Tuesday. Uh, and we have one tomorrow at 4.10. So tomorrow, uh, speaker Saj Doherty from uh, Dartmouth. It's, it's the usual time, the usual place is right here. Um, and today, the talk is an unusual unusual time and unusual place. So the speaker is Jeremy Martin from the University of Kansas. Um, and I put this in uh, interrogation because I hope that so many of you come that we don't fit here. I, I, think, I think you should come. Uh, uh, if we fit, we'll be in Thornton 935, but uh, we, might, we might move somewhere else. <clears throat> 
I mean, I, I really hope you come, you come to both, but especially this one is very relevant to you guys. If you, if you saw the, the title and abstract, it's called the Incidence Half Algebra of Graphs. So you know that's, that's for you. And in fact, let me, let me make a, a confession that maybe some of you already realized. Um, I come from a tradition, an academic tradition, that both my advisor and his advisor would just, you know, in the homework problems, they would put an open problem and they wouldn't say it's an open problem. And it's all homework, you know, and then just throw an open problem. Or uh, they would just take some very hard paper and then they would say, problem. And then you just put it there and it wouldn't say that it's a hard problem. Um, which, uh, you know, and so that's what I do as well, and you might have noticed already. Uh, it, I think it's maybe a bit harsh, but first of all, there are surprises. Like sometimes people find new proofs to things that were considered very hard, and then you know, somehow if you don't if you don't know that you're supposed to think is really hard, maybe you can find a better way to do it, and that and that has happened. And you know, actually, this, this happened in my classes, and that's one reason that I do it. Uh, but maybe a more important reason is that. I think it's important for you to see difficult things and to learn to tell hard from easy. Uh, and, uh, and so I think it's good if you stumble upon some really hard thing and you think about it for a week and you get nowhere and then you get to feel a little bit what math looks like because that is what it looks like. Um, anyway, so I did this in the last homework and there was a question about the Hobbes algebra of graphs and, uh, and that is a very beautiful paper of Jeremy Martin that I, I, I took his main theorem and I assigned it a homework problem. And it was a bit unfair, but actually uh, somebody solved it, which I was extremely happy about uh, through very hard work. And, uh, um, but anyway, um, he's going to basically explain you know, the whole, the whole uh, idea of where uh, his theorem with uh, his PhD student Brandon Humpert came with. And he's going to give you the background and he's going to give you the, the perfect formula for the antipode of the Hoff algebra of graphs. Um, and uh, yeah, I think it'll be a very interesting talk, especially for you guys. So, so you should go. Um, OK. So that's my commercial break right there. And um, after that, let's. So in the last homework, I decided to be a little bit nicer to you guys. And I threw open problems, but I, but I told you they were open. Uh, which doesn't mean you shouldn't try them. I mean. Anyway, so, so in my next example, what I want to do, so this is going to be example three. I'm going to consider. the same generating set, and uh, then I consider the product as before. I'm just going to change the, the, the equivalence relation. Okay. So the equivalence relation is going to be different now. And it's going to be the following. I wrote this a little bit differently in my notes. Actually, if you, if you, I'm going to show you an example, and I had thought about doing it in a different way. So if you want to see a different way of doing this, it's in the notes. Um, but let me define an equivalence relation as follows. So let's say that I take, so if, if I take a, a box of dimensions A1 up to AK. But let's say that there's some zeros in here. Okay, and so let's say that this is 0, 0, and then you get a B1, and then 0, 0, and then you get a B2, and then 0, 0, and you get a BL, and then 0, 0, etc. Okay, so these are the only non-zero entries. Only non-zero entries. So the, there, there can be any number of zeros between bi between the b's, okay? Um, 
then let's say that the standardization of the box LA1 up to LAK is the box LB1 up to LBL. Okay? So this is my definition of standardization. So you take a product like L3, L0, L0, L2, L0, L4, and you just drop the L0s and you get L3, L2, L4. Okay, so, so I'll write the definition, and, and why don't you guys think about it? So, so why? So basically, I want to say that these are. I want to force these to be equivalent. Okay. And so my question. Let me let me throw the question back at you. Why is this not just isomorphism? But let me say that. L A one. Up to L A K. Is isomorphic to. Is sorry. Is uh, equivalent to L B one up to. LBK if and only if they have the same standardization. Okay. So can you tell me how this is different from what we, we did before? I, I don't allow rearranging. So L2, L3 is different from L3, L2 here. So let me do some examples. So L5, L0, L3 is the same thing as L0, L5, L3, L0, L0. Right? Because if you, if you delete the L0s, you get the same thing. But L5, L3 is not the same thing as L3, L5. Okay? So that's the difference. So, so what I'm doing here is defining the equivalence relation on these products in example three, which is a different example from the yeah, one before. So, I mean, for this issue, you have here, how can you add it for example three? Or so, so this is for example three. Okay. Whereas in example two, these would have been equivalent, and these would also have been equivalent because these two are isomorphic as poses. Okay. So this is the difference. You, you basically just can't, can't swap non-trivial factors. Okay. Yeah? Um, we're actually just we're actually just gonna because this is gonna be my hereditary family of intervals, okay, and then I'm gonna define this equivalence relation on it. Okay. And uh, okay. So what what is a linear basis here now? So I, I still should have factors greater than or equal to 1, right? I don't want factors equal to 0 because they'll disappear. But now L5 and L3, L5, L3, and L3, L5 are different. So instead of this, I should have this. Okay, and now that's going to be a linear basis. And this is no longer called a partition. This is now called a composition. So a composition is just a, a list of positive integers, and they, not, they don't necessarily have to be in, in decreasing order. Okay. So that's my linear basis now. Okay. Now, if this is going to give me an incidence half algebra, then this better be a reduced congruence. Right? Otherwise, we're not doing anything here. And so let's, let's just go down the list and see whether it's trivial that this is a linear congruence, sorry, a, a reduced congruence, or, or we actually have to do something. So for example, 
Let's look at the first property of a reduced congruence, and let's see if it holds. Okay. So we take a poset Q in our family of size 1. What is that poset called? It, it's L0, right? The, the only, the only poset of size 1 that we have is L0. And we're claiming that P times L0 should be uh, equivalent to P. Is that true? Right? Yeah, right, because we drop L0s. And L0 times P also. Yeah, yeah I guess I should have said the standardization of L0 is L0. Yeah. Um, what about this? If, if P and Q are equivalent, then P times R is equivalent to Q times R. Is that true? No? I think it's true, right? Because if, if P and Q are equivalent, that means that they're the same thing except for a bunch of zeros. And now, if we multiply times R, then we just put some the same thing on both sides. And so that those things are still going to be equivalent modulo a bunch of zeros. Okay? Um, what about this one? If P is equivalent to Q, then there's a bijection from P to Q satisfying something. Yeah. yeah. So, in fact, let, let's, do, let's do an intermediate step here. So, if P and Q are equivalent, then they have the same standard, standardization. Okay? And so, let me go to the standardization and then to Q. So let's so let's say that this is the standardization of both. Okay. So to give an, a, a bijection from P to Q, I just give an, a bijection from P to the standardization. And what is that? Just drop drop all the all the zeros. And we also have the similar thing for Q. And then it's it's very, it's you have to do it, but everything is is very simple to check that um, that these bijections indeed have this property. So, in fact, this is a reduced congruence. Okay. And since it's a reduced congruence, that means that we have an incidence half algebra. Okay. What is the generating set as an algebra? Well, it's it's exactly the same generating set as before, right? That's how that's what we started with. What is the product now? It's somehow an even freer product than this one, right? Because now you don't even have this relation. You don't even commute. And so This is just the free product. Now you might object and say, well, if it's free, shouldn't it have no relations? I mean, I'm putting one relation. Right? So, the, right, so the, the thing about this is that actually we have to remember that L0 is 1. L0 is the 1 of the algebra. And so in any algebra, 1 times LA is equal to LA. And so this is, this is a, a trivial relation. Okay? But I guess I should, I mean, I, I also should write now that this is equal to LA, L0, because I don't know if, in principle, I wouldn't know if LA and L0 commute. But so I'm just saying LA times 1 is equal to 1 times LA is equal to LA. Well, so 
so so the so Brian's question is 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 it is it justified? Would it be useful to to say that the product of uh, let's see where did I I guess I mean I can just say the, is it useful to say that the product of LA LB is LA tensor LB? My answer is that it's it's not useful and it's actually not correct because the product is supposed to take two things in your algebra and give you a thing in the algebra. Okay. And uh, and if the algebra is the, the span of these things, then the, I mean, if the algebra is H, then P tensor P lives in H tensor H, which, I mean, here, delta takes H to H tensor H. And so here we're justified in having tensors because this lives in H tensor H. But when you multiply things, the product is supposed to land in H. And if you put tensors, that doesn't lo any longer live in H. I'm sorry? I, I'm a little confused about your point because if you multiply two chains on one LP, they're not in H. Right, but, but, they're, but they're one of these things. Yeah. I mean, I'm defining H to be the linear combinations of these things. And so when I multiply uh, LA times LB, I get just LA times LB, which is one of my generators. But if I were to write LA tensor LB, that doesn't live here. That doesn't live in this space. Yeah. And that's why I don't use tensors. Um, but it, but you, I mean you, you do have a very good point, and actually it's a point that is kind of addressed in the homework because in the homework I also ask you to put a half algebra on a tensor product, on the on the tensor algebra, and uh, and maybe your confusion might be that you already started working on the homework, uh, so maybe your confusion will be clarified when you when you look at the homework and you you do have to put uh, tensors in there. Okay. So just to kind of clarify that, we're starting with something that's not an Okay, so where was I? Product is the free product. What is the coproduct? The exact same argument works, right? The generators are still these posets, and the delta of this poset is still delta of ln is still li tensor ln minus i. So that's interesting. The coproduct looks exactly the same, but the product looks different. Okay. Antipode, it, it, it also looks the same. It also says homework for. <laughs> um, so that's the second part of that homework problem. Uh, the unit looks the same. The co-unit looks the same. Um, and the theorem, but I, th I shouldn't have been using L star all along. And maybe this is what you were confused by, Sam. Uh, I should have used something different here. Um, I don't know. Let me, for lack of a better name, I'm going to call it PL, products of else. Okay. Um, and then the theorem is that when you do when you do this, I mean, this is like, again a half algebra that we hadn't seen before. And the theorem, which will take more meaning later on, is that this is also an extremely important half algebra called n-sim. n-sim. And it's the half algebra of non-commutative symmetric functions. Um, if you don't mind, let me let me just delay the answer because it doesn't. I mean, it's going to be. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the the question is, what what does non-commutative mean? It means that you, that you don't commute or that you don't necessarily commute. I think that's what that's what you mean. And uh, 
I'll, I'll just say this, this half algebra of non-commutative symmetric functions has some basis where things where generators do not commute. That's how that's how it's defined. But that'll take more meaning later on. Okay. But those are two good uh, half algebras to keep in mind, and and you'll get to know them a lot better when you work them out when you work out the antipode and the homework. Okay. Um, okay. Let's do a different example. And uh, example four is going to be incidence half algebra of graphs. And again, the timing couldn't be better because this is exactly what the talk is about this afternoon. And so I'm going to, I'm not sure if Jeremy is going to talk about this half algebra from, from this point of view. And so I, I want to I wanna show it to you from one point of view. And then I think he's going to do something different. So what I want to do is show you that the half algebra of graphs, which you already are familiar with, and you already, in the last homework, worked out that it is a half algebra. And maybe you found a formula for the antipode, and maybe even it was the optimal formula. Um, I want to I show that this half algebra can also be produced from this machinery. Okay. So, so I want uh, half, I finally remember what's a, what's a good G, script G that kind of looks like a G. Half algebra of graphs. Half algebra of finite simple graphs. Um, and uh, just to remind you, the product of, uh, is just given by the disjoint union of these two graphs. Okay, this is called G1 disjoint union G2, so you just put them side by side. Um, and the co-product is that you look at all the subsets of your vertex set, and then you restrict the graph to the vertices in S. Tensor, you restrict the graph to the vertices not in S. So I want to recover this from uh, from the point of view of incidence half algebras. Okay. So let's let's think about how we would do this. Okay. And uh, and I want to kind of show you if if you were to do, try to do this from scratch, what would you have to think about? So so what do we need? We need we need we need this co to come from posets, right? Because the incidence half algebra thing starts with a, a hereditary family of posets. So what we need is that given a graph on G, we need to somehow have related to some poset. So graph G on some vertex sets, we need it related to some poset, some interval actually. Okay. Um, so what's Let's try something. So a trivial and maybe not too useful idea is the following. Let's say that I take my graph G and to it I assign the poset of subsets of the vertex set. Poset of subsets of V. Okay. So can you tell me why this is a bad idea? Maybe. You're losing a lot of information here, right? I mean, here you have a graph, and your graph have vertices and edges, and then I'm telling you, forget about the edges, and just make this post that only looks at the vertex set. And so this... This thing seems to forget too much. It, it just forgets what the graph was. Yeah? So 
So, so your idea sounds better, but I'm going to show that, that this bad idea actually works out. Okay. So I'm, I am I'm, I'm, I'm going to push this through, and you'll see. So far, I mean, when I first saw this, I thought that doesn't make any sense. But anyway, so t tell me something else that's wrong with this with this uh, construction. So. There's another problem, which is that if you have two graphs on the same vertex set, you're giving them the same poset. And so you don't really want that, OK? And so if g, g prime are graphs on the same vertex set b, then so far p of g is equal to p of g prime, OK? And, and, uh, and so not, not only does the, does the poset not distinguish the graph, but also we're sending different graphs to exactly the same thing. Okay? And so what I, what I want to do is say, let me just sol solve this in a kind of a strange way. But just, you know, label. So let me just say that the poset of this graph, here's a graph, right? Mm -hmm. So, kind of saying that one of the things you want to do is actually be that you can have some of the tables happen later in the time you're looking at the actual requirements of that early G taking the same graph and doing something like that. So, the, I, I guess the thing is that, I mean, we, we are going to be identifying graphs, but we want to identify graphs that are equal, not graphs that are different. And, and this thing is identifying every single graph on the same vertex set, and that's just too rough. I mean, I, 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 get, I get why we'd want to do that in sort of like what's a useful portion in a formal doesn't meet the criteria, but that's not a requirement or something like that, or is that like no, so what I'll call the stupid instrument of graphs? Or, you know, that's right. So, I mean, we, we don't necessarily have to do solve that problem, and, and we could get a, a stupid incidence half algebra that just doesn't know anything about graphs. But, so, but we want to make this construction relevant to graphs, and so we'll see how to build that in. Okay? So, so what I was saying is, to, to this graph, I want to associate this poset, but I want, to I want to remember which graph it came from. Okay? And so let me just put us a little subscript here, a drawing of the poset. And I'm not going to label the vertices because you wouldn't see anything. But the point is that I want to I want to attach to to the names of the vertices also the name of the graph. Okay. And that way, if I did the poset of the triangle graph, then it would look the same, but the labels would look a little bit different, and at least I would be able to tell them apart. Okay. Now, naturally, you know, the isomorphism is going to collapse these things, uh, possibly, but we'll but we'll see we'll see what happens. And the, there might be something to that, but I'm not sure. Um, so another problem, that, the problem that you guys were saying earlier is that P of G doesn't know anything about G. It doesn't know anything about the edges. OK, and so how am I going to solve that? Well, you see, I have a, give me just a second, Sam. I have this, which is pretty trivial. P I'm defining in a very trivial way. But I have another, I have a, what do you call it? I have an ace under my sleeve, which is that I haven't used the reduced congruence. And what I'm going to do is that I'm going to use the reduced congruence to take care of the graph theory. Okay. So what I'm going to do is that I'm going to say, uh, use the reduced congruence. I'm going to say set p g one and p of g two to be equivalent if g one and g two are isomorphic graphs. Okay, and they're not. Uh, I'm going to I'm going to try to define a reduced congruence like this. 
I'm going to use the reduced congruence to keep track of the graph isomorphism. Mm -hmm. So let me say the next problem is that uh, the set of P of G's, such that G is a graph, is not closed under products. And so my solution is going to be to just consider the products. As before. Okay? And I'm doing this uh, quickly because I don't have too much time left, but let me just write down the... I mean, what I wanted to show you was some of the issues that come up and why the definition looks the way it does. So now I'm going to actually write down how this is done. So so what is my hereditary family? It's going to be this. It's going to be the things of the form. Oh, it, it's not close under this or intervals. And so I need to consider the products, and I need to consider the intervals. Okay. Those need to be elements of my P of G. And so what I'm going to do is that I'm going to define P of G to consist of all the products of intervals of graphs. So G1 up to Gn are graphs. On vertex sets V1 up to Vn. And UI and WI are subsets of VI. Okay? So that's going to be my hereditary family. And the equivalence relation is going to be the following. I'm going to say that two of these products are equal. if and only if the graphs that they create are equal, are isomorphic. Okay, in other words, at the posit level, this construction is pretty trivial, but it's the equivalence relation that um, pays attention to the graphs. Okay? This is kind of a, a mouthful what I'm writing down here. Um, but uh, what I claim is that if you define this to be your hereditary family and this to be a reduced congruence, which we will parse, uh, when you do this, what you get is exactly the incidence of algebra of graphs. This will take a, a few minutes to, to understand what it is that I just wrote. But the proposition here is that this Hopf algebra that I get here is this one. The incidence Hopf algebra of graphs as I define it in the more manual way. Okay, so let me let me just make a quick comment about this, which is that you know if you did the if you did this problem in the homework, you'll realize that actually it's not it's not so hard to check that that this is really a half algebra, and it actually it's probably easier to check that this is a half algebra than to carry out this construction. Okay, 
The useful thing about this construction is that it allows you to understand that this half algebra of graphs actually comes from this more general context, and whatever you know about incidence of algebras, you can apply to that particular example. So let's let's think about what what this actually means. Okay. So how are we how are we using all of this stuff? So what's an element of this of this uh, hereditary family? You take a bunch of graphs. Each one has a vertex at v1 up to vm. Okay. And then inside each graph, inside each gi, you consider two subsets ui and wi. Okay. So you can think, you know. An element looks like G1, and then G2, and then Gn, okay? And then you take, you know, this is the vertex set V1, and so that means that the vertex set W1 is here, and the vertex set U1 is here. And here the vertex set Wn is here, and the vertex set Un is here. And so, at the level of posets, all you're doing is saying, okay, well, this is a Boolean poset because you know these are just posets of subsets. Uh, and so, as a poset, this is just two to the w one minus u one times etc. times two to the w n minus u n as posets. Okay, but the equivalence relation is what tells you what the graph looks like. Okay, and so really what you're going to do is say, well, you know, really, this is this posit stuff. I mean, this posit stuff is, is actually a little bit trivial. Uh, what's really important is what the isomorphism of the graph looks like. And the way you do that is you say, oh, sorry, this is, yeah, this is ui. And this is uj, okay? And so really what we're saying is, you know, just just look at these graphs that you took, this u1 minus this u1, w1, etc. And now just look at this part of look at this part of the graph. Look at this part of the graph, etc. Look at this part of the graph. Okay. And you're just gonna identify the two lattices, which are pretty trivial, if and only if the the induced graphs, the induced red graphs that I just drew, look the same. And so really you can kind of think of the generators of this thing as just being things that look like a red graph. Um, okay, so, so this is one of the possible points of views, points of view on incidence of algebras of graphs. Okay. Um, and uh, maybe maybe what I'll do is I'll ask you to look, look at the notes to see, I mean, why the linear basis looks like it does, the, the, and why the product and co-product match uh, the ones that we're used to. But I think I don't want to I don't want to dwell too much on this because the, I mean the, the point is you already know what the half algebra of graphs is, and I'm not showing you any, anything different. I'm just showing you that through a, a construction that is a little bit complicated, you can you can recover that object from from this point of view. Um, and uh, and yeah, then to, to see uh, what I what I think is, I've I've read Jeremy's paper and I, he no, he doesn't talk about any of this stuff, so I think his point of view is going to be pretty different from from this one. Um, so so yeah, you should you should go and, and see it. Okay, question. So, so the question is, when I, when, I, when I constructed the poset of this graph, why do I have this element? And the answer is that this, this construction is so stupid that it doesn't even see what the graph is. It, it only sees that the vertices are called 1, 2, and 3, and so it just looks at all the subsets of vertices, and, it, and this construction completely ignores the edges. Okay. And so the, the point is that when you, when you do P of the graph, you forget about the edges. So that's not where the intelligent part comes. That, this part is pretty trivial. Where, where we're actually doing something intelligent is, is with the equivalence relation. This is when you actually pay attention to the edges. Okay. And this equivalence relation is just going to collapse graphs that look the same 
as, as it should. Okay. Naturally, one thing you have to check about this construction is that this is a, a reduced congruence. And this is kind of the, the meat of the argument, but it's, it's actually pretty easy when you, when you just sit down and, and do it. Oh, and, and uh, I guess you know another thing I'll say is that uh, given that we have a formula for the antipode of any incidence half algebra, that means that we get a formula for the antipode of, of graphs. But that's not the optimal formula. That's basically the formula that you get from Takeuchi. And so the, you know, the talk today is about what the optimal formula actually is. Okay. So yeah, so that's it.